Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Kathleen Rourke from Candlewood Press, and I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing the fourth episode in the Black Creator series, Bringing Books to Your Classroom Community, a collaboration between the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project and Candlewood Press. Each month we will be featuring a Black author or illustrator in conversation with Sonia Cherry Paul, Director of Diversity and Equity at Teachers College Reading and Writing Tonight, we welcome Frederick Joseph, an award-winning marketing professional, media representation advocate, and writer who was recently selected for the Forbes 30 Under 30 list. He's also the winner of the 2018 Bob Clampett Humanitarian Award given by Comic-Con International and was selected for the 2018 Route 100 list of most influential African-Americans. Sonia and Frederick will be able to reply to comments during the presentation, so we invite you to use the comments section to ask questions. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Hey, Fred, how are you? I'm good, Sonia. Always a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Same, same. So let's jump in and talk about your New York Times bestselling book, um, The Black Friend. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly so everyone can see. And Fred, you've titled this book, the Black Friend on Being a Better White Person. So there's an explicit implication here, right, about who this book is for. But is there is there an implicit invitation as well? Who exactly is the Black Friend for? You know, it's interesting because obviously based on the subtitle, one could assume that the book is solely for um, white people. But, you know, what, what I've heard from many and what my hope was, and I actually say this pretty explicitly in the beginning of the book, it's it, there's also an invitation there for non-white people to feel seen, right? And, and I said to someone recently, my goal in making this book was to also protect young non-white people, because a lot of the experiences in this um, book that I talk about, my own personal experiences, and then some experiences some of the people I speak with talk about, um, they're, they're happening every single day to young people, and they some of them just don't know how to articulate what's going on, right? You know, people will read about when I was, you know, in elementary school dealing with racism, well, how does the nine-year-old speak up? about racism when it's an educator doing it. So, you know, this book is also um, a direct invitation um, for uh, young non-white people and, not, and non-white people generally. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I do believe that this book is really for everyone. It is for white young folks to read. It is definitely for non-white folks to read so that, as you said, they feel seen and validated. I know I sure did as I read that book. Um, and I've also been saying that it's for all educators to read, regardless of, of grade level. Um, I believe all educators should read your book. Um, it's essential learning for them. And you know, in the preface of your book, you, you write to your little brother. And you say, I just want to read this little part here. You said, it won't be long before the stress of being Black in this world finds you. And, you know, when you started talking about it's for, for, for people of color also to feel seen and validated, it made me think about that part in the book. And I just wanted to ask you, um, when's the first time that you really understood that something about race really matters and that something about being black meant having a very different experience in the world. Do you, do you have a moment in your, in your young life where you remember that? Yeah, I, I think my, my, the specific moment that I understood um, the, the impact of race and, and just like oppression in that way on, on me as a, as a person and, and a young person was when Amadou Diallo, um, when, when that, 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 that entire situation happened, um, you know, my mother introduced me to the story of Emmett Till at that time. And, and I was probably 11 years old, maybe younger, um, when I first learned of Emmett Till and, and when Amadou Diallo happened. And, um, and, and, I, and I had to be introduced not only to um, the 
simple ways or the, the non-overt ways in which racism manifests in our society. But, you know, the, the direct um, mortal danger that I was in um, every time I left the house um, and currently leave the house as a uh, non-white person. Yeah. I'm thinking about for myself, um, you know, you say you were about 11 when this, when this happened. Yeah. I'm thinking about, you know, I think I was four or five, Fred, when I started to recognize that something about um, being black seemed to really mean that I was going to have a very different experience because I was noticing commercials on television and I was noticing the shampoo commercials and how they were always white women with long straight hair and never anybody with kinky, you know, hair like me. And I, of course, didn't have the language for it at the time, but I knew something about, you know, um, something about those commercials was revealing for me in a way that, you know, I felt like I was being told that I didn't really matter. Um, so, mm. Your book obviously talks about all of the subtle and overt ways from, you know, Amadou Diallo to, you know, Emmett Till to, you know, shampoo commercials, right? The overt and, and um, nuanced ways as well that racism um, exists. But you also help young people understand what it means to be anti-racist. And I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about teachers, yeah. how can they become truly an anti-racist? And one thing I always say to educators is this need to do the, the personal work that they'll need to do in advance in order to advance the work of anti-racism. There's a way in which I think sometimes some educators feel like they can just show up in their classrooms and be one person, but in their personal lives, they wanna maintain things exactly the way they are. What's some of the work all educators can do personally in order to show up in ways that are truly anti-racist professionally? You know, I, I think that for me, number one, before I, I'm going to answer that, um, but I think, you know, it's important to realize that anti-racism is a 365, 24-7 job, right? Like, you know, even I as a Black person, you know, I just mentioned um, that at 11 years old when I first started kind of having a deep understanding of race. Um, but that's part, part of that is because my community had no idea because we were so entrenched in it, right? Um, you know, th that being said, I, I think that the personal work is first, honestly, accountability, Right. You know, I, I think that what I've seen, um, you know, s especially since June um, with the protests for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, are a lot of what about isms. You know, a lot of people are focused on what isn't them as opposed to what could be them. You know, um, you know, a lot of people have read my book also, and, and, and you know, I've got message people, people thanking me because they're they're not real. They're realizing because of the book, you know what? I didn't even understand that I was perpetuating and perpetrating racism against my own students for years and just assuming that the black kid in my class was on the basketball team, mm. right? You know, things like that. So I think that's the first thing is accountability. The second thing is really having a clear understanding that this is work. This isn't a moment. Right. This is not this is not a moment. This isn't like you said, oh, I go into the classroom and I teach um, stamped or I teach the black friend and then I go home and my uncle is um, a, a, a overt white supremacist. Right. This because that seeps into every aspect of your life. And I say this in the book, if you were really about combating racism, no racist would feel comfortable around you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like. For, for me, um, I am someone who, I'm not just an anti-racist, I'm an anti-homophobe, I'm an anti-misogynist, um, uh, I'm an, I'm an anti-transphobe, I'm an I'm a, I'm a anti-classist, I'm an anti-elitist, and because of those things, the people who subscribe to those issues are not comfortable around me, and that lets me know I'm constantly doing the work. So I think those are the two things that I will focus on, is accountability and a preparedness to do the work. And then when you got those two things, get out there and actually start doing it. Woo. 
I love that, Fred. Absolutely. Because honestly, you know, if you are really doing the work, people who aren't should be uncomfortable around you, right? Sometimes people will say things to me like, oh, Sonia, this person said this thing, this educator said that thing to me. And I, and I, and I listen to them and then, and then I say to them, you know, I want you to just deeply consider this. What is it about you that made that person think they could say that to you? Mm -hmm. Your job is to figure out how to show up differently. So that person knows that they couldn't possibly dream of saying that thing to you because you would not agree. Um, so that internal work is just is just so important. And I love that you started with the accountability and we need to stop with the what about isms and the conflation um, because it is really a, a way to resist the work. Yep. So Fred, in the book, you write about neighborhoods that I live in now and have worked near. And so it was such a personal read for me particularly as an educator who worked in a predominantly white affluent school district. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, you know, one thing in particular that was difficult to navigate for me in that space, and I know it's difficult for other BIPOC educators as well, is, is white colleagues exasperation wanting to know when will it be enough? And you started to touch upon this, but I want us to, to push a little further. Um, you write, I believe it's in the introduction um, in your text, you write, all wise people know that no one knows everything. If you feel you don't need to read this book because you're already a decent white person, there's a good chance you're not as decent as you think. And I remember being asked by a board member in the district where I taught, you, you know, Sonia, if we focus on anti-racism as a district, how much time do you think we'll need? One year, two years, three years? <laughs> and for educators, parents, caregivers, board members, Fred, looking to quantify the work of equity, particularly in predominantly white schools and districts, what can they learn from the Black friend about how much and how long teachers, schools, and districts need to need to focus on this? You know, I, I think the Black friend, one of the, one of the, I think the things that makes it special is that it talks about nuances that are so deep and ingrained in our society that you, you, you won't be asking yourself the question of how long um, when you're finished, right? Because you can't say how long when you realize that you have a systemic issue in the very ways in which you are not just teaching children, but assessing children and, and, and being critical um, of children, right? You, you can't say how much when you realize that even in the language that you've had with your own romantic partners or your own best friends, you have been subtly and overtly racist, right? So I think that the black friend touches on things that are not um, just historical in context, because I think that looking at just the history of white supremacy in our country would allow one to think, you know what, if we move past this, you know, and we use a certain amount of time, then we'll be fine. What the black friend does is says, no, these daily manifestations are so insidious that even in your assumption that there was a time stamp, you are inherently upholding the issue that you think that you're trying to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And another part of your book that I think really brings that to, to light, I mean, you do it all throughout, but, um, in this part of, of the book, you write, um, let's face it, Black people and people of color are taught in school, in the media, and in everyday interactions to be empathetic and understanding of white people and their history. But most white people never have to do the same for us. And, and, and because of the longevity and the magnitude of that in this country, as you said, there's no timestamp. <laughs> there's this is ongoing, continuous work. And speaking of ongoing and continuous work, Fred, it's Black History Month, <laughs> and many educators feel right now that now is the time to be thinking and teaching about Black people. Um, mm -hmm. And so we know that's an issue. And then there's this tendency to do it 
in, you know, using these canned and oversimplified narratives, not to, as you write, um, really teach about Black people and our histories, mm -hmm. which of course requires educators to know about Black history themselves. Um, what was Black History Month like for you in school? And how, how do you think educators can break the cycle of teaching in such limited ways? You know, Black History Month for me in school was, um, looking back, it was extremely problematic, right? It was whatever type of history made my white educators feel good, um, you know, for 28 days. I had nothing to do with supporting me or my fellow black students or um, helping move systemic um, change along, right? Uh, you know, I, I think one thing in particular stands out when I got to college um, is when I first truly learned about, uh, you know, the Reverend, the late Reverend uh, Dr. King. And, 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 and it was interesting because the juxtaposition I remember in class, and I'll, I'll, I'll never get this, I wanna write about it one day, but my, my, my professor um, asked who knows um, quotes by Dr. King and everybody got up, oh, you know, love and this and that third. He mm -hmm. said, well, what about the critiques of capitalism, what about the critiques of, of, of certain um, other forms of discrimination in this country? He's like, well, what about the fact that he was a socialist and at and 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 and, and, and nature? And, and I was like, what? I remember responding, I said, what do you what do you mean? That wasn't Dr. King. Doctor, that sounds like Malcolm X, right? And then he's like, he said, young brother, we have so much work to do. Yeah. Right. And, and that's because of Black History Month, really, because all I knew in, in, in Black history was books that my, my family left around or what was through a white gaze in school, all that to say that. Yeah, yeah. I love that you bring Dr. King up as the example, because Fred, I don't know if you know, I do a yearly Twitter rant right before um, his birthday about the way folks like to handle the I have a dream speech. They like to handle that speech as if there are not two and a half pages before it, you know, where he is breaking down the social, economic and political conditions for black folks in, in the United States. Teachers wanna just teach the dream part. And, you know, one of the things I always call for is to really get to know Dr. King and his work. He was radical and he was strategic. And I think you're right that folks um, who are teaching Black history in these oversimplified ways, they're teaching it because it makes them feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, and, and that has everything to do with whiteness. So let's get into a little bit of whiteness, Fred. Um, yeah. You know, after the murder of, of George Floyd, you know, um, we saw this momentum on the part of white people like we really not seen. Um, but what I'm noticing is a willingness to, to talk about black oppression, but not whiteness and white supremacy. And we know that folks are not teaching about racism if they are unwilling to talk about whiteness. So can you talk about why that's important and how do you help young people in your book understand and confront whiteness? Well, you know, I think this goes back to accountability, right? Um, accountability for me is one of the most important concepts that should be uh, discussed during this, uh, this renaissance or this movement for black lives, if you would because it directly speaks to whiteness versus just speaking to, it's like, okay, black people have been oppressed. Black people suffer from systemic oppression. Well, you have to look at who are the oppressors, right? Like throughout the history of not only this country, but globally, this is just being honest, whiteness has been violent, right? You know, you look at the violence perpetrated against, uh, you know, indigenous people in this country, you look at the violence perpetrated against uh, indigenous people in, Canada, you look at the violence perpetrated against um, people in South America, Central America, so on and so forth. This is this is systemic, right? This is historic, and it hasn't stopped. There is a there's a through line um, from the moment that people landed uh, in in Roanoke, Virginia, all the way to the Capitol insurrection, right? And people have to understand that white 
whiteness has been violent in this country and around the world. And, th and there's a white rage that is constantly, um, you know, underlying in our society that people are afraid to talk about. And the fact that people are afraid to talk about it and be held accountable for it gives it more oxygen for that, for that uh, fire to be um, fanned and that flame to grow. Mm. Whew, I love what you just said about that through line. I'm going to just try to echo what you just said so educators can hear that, that when we are thinking about whiteness and teaching about whiteness and understanding whiteness, we need to be paying attention to that through line from 1619, right, when enslaved Africans showed up on the shores of Virginia um, to 2021 at the Capitol. Um, thank you for, for just putting it down just like that. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement, which we know has been trying to get folks to focus on that through line and to disrupt whiteness. Um, started by co-founders Opal Tmedi, Alicia Garza, and Patrice, Patrice Khan Colors, it's been going strong since 2014. Mm -hmm. But six years later, even after the killings of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, um, and George Floyd, we're still having to address why all lives matter is problematic, and I would argue racist, a racist response to the declaration that Black Lives Matter. And you write about this, and I just want to read um, this section because I think it not only brings clarity to kids, it can be particularly um, helpful to educators and caregivers who continue to say this. So I'm just going to read um, this bottom part of the page and into the next one, and then I'll, I'll ask you about this. You write, all lives matter is directly related to white people not wanting to see color and not wanting to make things about race. It's an effort to derail the people who are saying that black lives matter while they are burying children like Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice. It's an effort to neutralize the message that we need to uplift the importance of black lives because so many people act as if those lives don't count. I want you to see my race and I want you to see the race of other people of color and the trauma many white people have caused us. And I want you to own those traumas and to be better. But I also want you to see more than our pain and our struggle. I want you to see the beauty in our differences. I want you to see black mothers perfecting their collard greens recipe. I want you to see Chinese grandparents teaching their children to make dumplings by hand. I want you to see Puerto Rican fathers teaching their children the history of salsa music. I want you to see Indian mothers placing colorful saris on their daughters. I don't want to be seen as a human. I don't want to be seen as the same. I want to be respected. I want to be special. I want to be jazz. I want to be soul food. I want to be poetry. I want to be black. Could you talk a little bit about the ways that the all lives matter statement is really the sibling of I don't see color, maybe even its twin? You know, I actually can, can take it a step further than that, but I'll, I'll comment on that first. You know, all lives matter is is a white lash. Um, you know, all lives matter, like white power to black power, is is a direct um, contradiction um, and an attack on a very simple concept of of respecting um, uh, uh, black people. It's not even. It doesn't even say love black people. It doesn't even say black lives prosper, right? It's mm -hmm. on a baseline in a country that has, um, you know, strung us from trees and, and had its uh, police officers bury us on camera. Um, it's just saying we matter. In this system, in this country, we matter. Um, and all lives matter. That effort is, is one to, as I said, derail that. It's not, nothing more. Nothing more. Um, but I, but I, I do think that, you know, one thing I would have included in the book that I'll say for the first time here, um, you know, I, I think that the All Lives Matter movement also comes out of the, the one human um, movement of, you know, the 70s and 80s, um, you know, which is, 
you know, even people who I, I like, um, you know, like Jane Elliott, um, you know, ha are people who have pushed that movement historically, right? It's like, oh, we can all be uh, the same. And, and that's another way of saying colorblind. And I think it's deeply problematic because, again, what it does is it negates accountability um, for the historic uh, trauma and the current traumas that non-white people face. You know, it's, it's, it's not okay for me to say, um, oh, women are the same as men because that completely, um, you know, erases um, all accountability and privilege that I have in the system um, and, 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 and what trauma um, women face daily, as an example. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right. I think all, all of these roads are leading back to accountability, <laughs> accountability. Um, so I wanna talk about another way that you know, educators can think about their role and accountability um, by, by reading The Black Friend, um, by thinking through the lens of, of students of color in particular. Um, one of the major issues I would say that a lot of BIPOC students and predominantly white school districts navigate regularly is cultural appropriation, which you write leads to desensitivity and dehumanization. And for many students I've taught, they've tried a variety of tactics, some of them that you've written about. They have tried to ignore it. They've tried to laugh along as a way of coping. Um, they've asked teachers for help. And many of them say that they've often felt their teachers have heard or saw and even sometimes participated in this. Um, but then they ignore and downplay it when, when students are asking for help. So in a Kardashian capitalistic society, Fred, that has a longevity of commodifying Black people and BIPOC communities, how are you trying to educate white kids about this in the Black friend? And how should educators, teachers, administra administrators, how should they address this? You know, I, I think what, one of the things, again, that makes the Black Friend stand out and, you know, um, be different from other books is that I give firsthand real world examples um, from my own experiences. And, and I think when touching upon, you know, cultural appropriation, it's, it's, it's a very difficult subject. Um, so I gave a story in which um, not only did I include myself, but there's Latinx friends that I have. You know, a, a lot of people, you know, say things like, well, what about appreciation? What if I'm just appreciating? Well, people have to realize appreciation comes with research. Appreciation comes with um, an ability to not disrespect. You know, I, I think one really good example I saw recently was um, someone for Halloween uh, dressed as uh, Barack Obama. And um, no, they actually did it well though. It was, <laughs> yeah, they, they dressed as, <laughs> they dressed as Barack Obama and they just, they put on a suit of a very similar suit to like what he wears, like, you know, presidential blue and things like that. And they put on a hope um, sticker and it just kind of like, kind of made his voice like, oh, Michelle, and this, you know, um, <laughs> as opposed to putting on blackface, right? And I, and I, and I, and I highlight that because that is the direction that I want people to go. That's appreciation. You're appreciating the man as opposed to disrespecting his blackness, right? You know, the same thing with um, hair. Hair is a, is a huge one. Um, you know, when, when I say to people, okay, do you know the history of cornrows in, in this country? Right? Do you know why a lot of people who were enslaved wore their hair in cornrows? And do you know what they hid in those cornrows because they had to feed their families or themselves? And they're like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, so before you even could understand why you're wearing this, you need to understand why you shouldn't be wearing this. Right? So I'm, I, you know, throughout the book, I, I tried to do a good job of not just kind of wagging my finger or waving my finger at people saying, don't do this, don't do that, but really give good examples um, as to why um, and the context for what I was talking about. Yeah, you do that. You do that really well. And I love that you include so many different perspectives, as you said, from your friends and you have a very wide friend group that's racially and culturally diverse. And you also do that in the, um, as you're including these different perspectives um, that really just help 
um, I think readers get so much more out of, out of the topics you cover. Um, you also include some powerhouse voices as well, like Angie Thomas and Jamel Hill. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about the structure of this book. Was it intentional from the start or, or, or as you were writing, did you think, you know what, I should probably talk to some other folks about this. What, what made you bring all these voices in? No, it was, it was always intentional. Um, you know, the book actually stemmed from a moment that took place that was deeply racist. And then a tweet that I put out saying that I was going to, I didn't know how I was gonna structure the book, but I knew that I wanted um, you know, various voices because I, I think that um, when people are talking about um, you know, racism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, so on and so forth, people have to say there's intersectionality to everything. As a, I, you know, I'm a cisgender, heterosexual black man and I have my specific experiences within racism and white supremacy. So I, I think that it's important, especially for young people to see the intersectionality and the interwoven connection um, through the struggle against oppression in that way, right? So, you know, one example, um, when I spoke to Angie, you know, Angie had already, um, you know, released uh, on the come up and hate you give uh, I had I didn't have a book out yet um, so her perspective as a black author was very interesting because she wrote about um, blackface in literature right like that's what we discussed and and I thought it was so profound because a lot of people had read her book and you're like oh I'm connecting the dots right um, and then just outside of that she's a black woman I'm not a black woman you know the same thing goes for Syra Rao who is a Southeast Asian woman or um, Rabia Chowdhury or April Rain. I, I, and I especially wanted um, women throughout the book because I'm already a man, right? Like, um, and, I, and I wanted to make sure that my voice, um, you know, was able to create space. If I'm asking people to create space and access through this book, I wanted to demonstrate some of that firsthand um, with my own project. Mm, so wonderful. And, and Fred, because you are, um, as you write in the book, dynamic and layered, I just love that part of the book so much because that it's just so important for educators to just read every part and really marinate in, in all that you bring here. Um, because you are dynamic and layered, could you share a little bit about um, your career and the work you've done and are involved with in addition to writing? and and is there a through line in your work that connects all that you do? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> it's embarrassing. Oh, I, I don't have to talk about myself. Uh, but, uh, you know, my, my, my background is in marketing outside of writing. I, I went to school for political science and um, creative writing. And to be quite frank, um, a lot of people told me it was going to absolutely be impossible for me to become um, a writer. Um, and therefore I focused on becoming an attorney, um, but I dropped out of law school because I was, <laughs> that was not um, something I was interested in. And I went back to school and got my MBA in marketing. And you know, over the years I've done some pretty cool campaigns uh, such as the Black Panther Challenge and the Rent Relief Campaign. The first was to take kids to see Black Panther for free. The second was to uh, help people with um, you know, funds during uh, the pandemic. Um, but I, I think that the through line from marketing to philanthropy to this book to my coming books is trying to help people, to be quite frank, right? Like that's, you know, I was always taught that if you, if you have the ability to put your hands to work, make it good work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, I try to make sure that I'm doing good work. Um, you know, and I'm, I like to be intentional about everything um, I do at all times. So even when I'm, t when I'm doing conversations like this or I'm showing up in the media, I oftentimes kind of wear, um, you know, less author stereotypical attire um, because I wonder what people's assumptions are going to be. And I'm trying to push back against those assumptions, right? Like right now in a, a, a long sleeve t-shirt and a beanie um, versus a tweed jacket and, and my glasses, you know, I have my contacts in because I want people to start understanding that 
you know, a black person in certain spaces doesn't have to look any specific way to align with any specific thing. So, you know, everything I'm doing at all times is pretty intentional about getting people to uh, reframe their thinking. And I hope that people watching this, when they heard that last part, um, do a little self-assessment about whatever they assume based on my attire also. Mm. So interesting. Um... I love that. And, and I'm, I have no doubt that um, you'll continue to, as you said, think about intentionally making good work. What can we look forward to, Fred? What's next for you? What can readers um, get excited about? What's coming up? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I'm not sure uh, what I'm supposed to say, what I'm not supposed to say, but I do have two books um, you know, in the pipeline. Um, one of them is going to be my debut um, adult book, and the other one will be um, somewhat of a follow-up to The Black Friend, um, but tackling um, more global issues, um, you know, such as environmental justice and ableism and things of that nature, because I think that the work is, is anti-racism, and anti-racism is at the intersection of so many other um, oppressive forces, and, and you know, to, to combat one, you have to kind of combat many of them. Uh, and there's some brilliant voices who I'm hoping to have in one of those books as well, Sonia, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Fred, I love that you say the work is anti-racism. It is the work. It is the work from which all other work must um, um, emerge. Mm -hmm. And what struck me about the Black Friend, um, among many things, is, is the way that you reveal yourself for young people and all readers, not only the, the struggles and obstacles that come with being Black in America, but the joys, the triumphs of being Black. And by, by being authentically you, you encourage young people to show up authentically as themselves, fully, unabashedly. And you close out your book with one of my favorites, Umi Says by, says by Most Deaf, which couldn't be more perfect. Um, because with the Black Friend, you, Fred, shine your light for all readers to see, but also for them to be challenged and to be changed. And I want to ask you, what does it mean to you to be a Black creator? For me, it, it really is about standing on the shoulders of giants who came before me. You know, um, I am... I'm constantly privileged and even like emotional right now because it's a question that doesn't necessarily get asked all the time. Um, but I think during Black History Month, especially, um, it means a lot to me to build a legacy um, that will last and maybe one day kids will be reading about me during Black History Month and my experiences and my thoughts. Um, but you know, when I think of just being a Black creator, I, I think of Octavia Butler, I think of Toni Morrison, you know, I, I think of James Baldwin, I think of all the, the brilliant people who paved the way for me to be here. Um, you know, the educators who I, who I didn't have, who I'm trying to help influence to, to one day exist, you know, people like you, um, you know, it, I, I wonder how much sooner I could have stepped into some of this had I had a you. Um, you know, and, and, and it, it really does mean a lot to me to be in this space, but I'm thinking of always how I can get other people into the space as well and, and earlier and more often. Thank you, Fred. It's been so great to chat with you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Happy Black History Month, everyone. I'm so thankful for this powerful conversation, and I hope you all feel empowered and inspired to share Frederick's good work with your colleagues and students. To help you begin classroom discussions, Sonia created an amazingly comprehensive teacher guide that you can find linked in the chat and on Candlewick Press, Press's website. Please join us in March for the next conversation in the Black Creator series. Our guest will be multiple award-winning author Tekla Magoon, who was most recently awarded the 2021 Margaret A. Edwards Award, honoring her significant and lasting contribution to writing for teens. For a full schedule of conversations and links to an accompanying podcast, please visit blackcreatorseries.candlewick.com and check the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project's Facebook page for past episodes. Thank you again for joining the conversation. Mm -hmm.